Welcome to the Trend Detection Podcast, powered by Siemens. And now your host, Niall Sullivan. Yeah, so I guess um, one, one thing I've just thought about in my, in my head how to position it, I guess for uh, what you described from the older generation is the computers are in here. Well, for those listening, um, head, yep. in the head. <laughs> I'll just realize. It, it, now it's, the, it's, yeah. it's like dial up at times, right? They're a little slow. <laughs> slow to, to pick up on something new but yeah it's the the computer's in their head and i've phrased it a few times doing demos for cmms's where we had an an older gentleman on the call and i'm like we're not trying to replace you we're not trying to change how you've done things i'm asking you to tell us how you do things and then put it into this system right and i'm just going to generically say i was talking to bob and I said, look at this system as a little Bob, right? Mm -hmm. This is a replication of you. This is just a newer digital version of you. Tell it what you know and let it live on so you can go fishing full time or you can go to Cancun or you can go to Marbella, wherever, right? Go wherever you want a vacation and go enjoy what you've earned. Again, but not as a business continuity function not letting the business just fall flat on its face because it didn't have this information digitized. Yeah, it's sort of it's like scaling scaling expertise is one way to do it because I mean, yeah, because that's the challenge. If it's one person, I know we talked about one person with lots of knowledge, but it's also one person doing uh, you know checking every every machine or whatever. But if you can automate that part of the process, then you can focus on actually the the important the key aspects of your job where you can really make a big difference and impact on the business. That's the, the other way to look at it, I guess. Same way I was talking about earlier with TPM of taking away some of the not low skill, just lower skill work from the maintenance team so they can focus on the more high skill, very technical things that, again, they're specialists in. Let the operators do more of the low skill work by training them up to that level. But again, even furthermore, reducing their workload or allowing yourself to upskill skill them even further by automating some of the low end work that they do, like what is our cycle count? What is our punch count for the day? Again, through condition monitoring tools that can drive process data. I mean, I even talked to SMRP, uh, Boston Dynamics was there and we were talking about some of the application for their robot spot and a few other companies who have bought spot and use it for other applications and talking about the human variable factor of taking like offline condition monitoring, right? Going up and doing a handheld for like an amp clamp, taking an amperage reading on an electric motor, right? Human factors. I may put it in a different position on that clamp, which may throw off and create a variance in the readings from day to day, which over time accumulate in a variance, right? Versus if spot goes, spot goes to the exact same precision spot every single day to take that reading. And it's a more reliable data set with less variance, right? It's again, it's very advanced. Spot is a probably a very expensive tool, not great for every application, but some applications it's great in. I just saw a video on LinkedIn yesterday about the application of a spot like robot for large oil and gas fields that can go around in different areas and take gauge readings or do infrared of certain hot spots, And it's just this daily preventative maintenance checklist that it automates. And you don't have to spend a technician going out and doing that no longer. That technician can now focus on value added task versus just condition monitoring assessments. Yeah. And that's a and that's a great example of where yeah, cause it's that, I think you mentioned it before as well. It's often seen that technology is taking over like certain <laughs> roles, and it, yeah, it's a little bit. And especially when you throw AI, that's when it really sort of takes off yep. um, into another stratosphere. But ultimately, it's there to aid aid their job, make mm -hmm. you know, make it less stressful. You know, maybe not less completely, dangerous. complete, not removing stress completely, I guess, but yeah. it's making it more manageable and planned. So you you have an idea. Well, I guess I'm again thinking predictive maintenance, but you have an idea and being able to plan ahead of time potentially, yeah. rather than being surprised. You know, when exactly. when stuff happens, yeah. But also reducing risk. I mean, what's the the first the first mitigation effort when identifying risk? 
tried to avoid it if at all possible. So think of falling hazards or again, X, Y, Z hazards that sending a physical labor-based technician to go perform or an operator perform, if we can now automate that, it reduces the liability of that risk of impacting human life or human damage or injury if something goes wrong during that inspection. I like to think of on ships, right? If we can send robots or drones into void cavities within certain compartments of a ship that are very claustrophobic for humans, very tight, right? But then also think of if the air quality is bad or if there's a, a, a poisonous element in the air, right? You're not sending someone who's going to have a hard time getting out of that space. Kind of like mining, right? They used to send canaries down to test if the air quality was good or bad. It's like doing that now, but with advanced technologies like robots, um, trying to automate and reduce the risk to humans of sending you into a potentially hazardous situation, which again, allows you to focus on more value added task with the limited amount of skilled trade that you have in the short term, while you formulate ways in the long term to build a healthier pipeline of talent that you can tap into in the future. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and again, just shifting gears slightly. So one thing we haven't touched upon, well, we talked about it a little bit, I guess, but in terms of training and the ability for that to, to bridge that knowledge gap, maybe you can, we could dive into that a little bit and, you know, you know, maybe how to go about it. Maybe I know it might seem like an obvious question, but maybe it's, maybe it's not as obvious as it seems possibly. For the training for the knowledge gap, how do I address that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's going to come down to the same things we always see, which are, it has to be both documented processes, so a simple plan someone can follow, but also it needs to be OJT, on-the-job training, right? There needs to be a mentorship element to it, to where you have someone who's experienced and can coach them through it, but still allow them to make some, some small mistakes that don't have high-risk implications, but then you have to have it documented. That's kind of the underlying basis is that OJT is great, but it come, kind of comes back to a quote that's been floating around on LinkedIn for a while, which is, again, a, C, a CFO and a CEO are talking and the CFO says, what if we train them and they leave, right? So if you train mm -hmm. them up with OJT, but they leave, you lose all that knowledge you had. But then the CEO rebuttaled with well, what happens if we don't train them and they don't leave? Right. It's kind of, it's a double whammy. Like you're, That's amazing. you're yeah. screw me if I do screw me if I don't. Right. Uh, it's double edged sword, but would you rather have, I think this takes to another step past training them up is how you treat them, right? How you pay them, how you incentivize keeping them at your organization, which may be through the application of digital tools. That's generally where digital natives don't want to go is the analog industries because uh, they want to feel empowered. But you have to train them, but then there must be documentation and that documentation serves as that succession planning and that knowledge base that future positions can reference. So I think it's too wrong there. I know some businesses are hesitant of formally written procedures because then again, they're bound to follow those procedures. And if you don't follow those procedures, there could be some liability there but they have to be the right procedures and you have to coach people to do the right things at the right time. And again, I, I think that was Christer Idhammer. Um, I'm not totally sure on that quote, but it, it draws back, like we have to do the right things. Yeah. And I think that, that empowerment aspect is important. Again, I'm going to repeat, repeat myself. My, my previous ses session this afternoon, um, that is, it's not just, I've heard numerous examples of this where, um, and it's, it's so interesting what you said actually about that conversation between because that between the, was it CEO and CFO you said but it's it's almost like that's almost like a proactive versus reactive thing you either take take control of the situation or you sort of be cautious and wait for the and then the inevitable um, happens but again the point I was referring to is the power of technology to to actually empower employees. I mean, we've actually seen with Sensei predictive maintenance that um, the tools become so much part ingrained in the, the working life and culture of the business that um, the key champions and users are the, have actually been promoted as part of that role, you know, because of the, 
the success of the platform means success for the business, which means success for individuals involved in in that success, if that makes sense. But, but taking yeah. that a step further, what happens to, again, knowing how to utilize a digital tool like Sensei is a skill, right? That is upskilling of your current staff, of how to utilize those technologies to the business, to the benefit of the business. So if they leave, do you think they're going to go to a reactive organization? No. They're going to go to another organization that has that same goal or same mentality or utilizing Sensei or another similar like tool, right? So again, it becomes very hard to find the talent to drive that kind of innovation in manufacturing because the skills that they acquire through the use of that application that now becomes what they know and what they like because they understand the value of it and they can take that value to another organization. Yeah. Like, so I guess it depends on the mindset because if of, of the individual, say, you know, they built up and became a champion and delivered all this great digital transformation, implemented technologies and stuff, and they go to another organization that doesn't have that in place, I guess it's more the personal mindset is whether they want to go through that journey again <laughs> you know i, I did it rewarded. yeah what did oh yeah well explain it. Yeah. yeah what were your challenges that was, and that was my yeah, last job is i went in and i was just looking for a simple job right um but i understood the maturities of maintenance organizations and i had an opportunity to go to a, a larger manufacturing facility that i would just i would have been a number right but i wanted the challenge because in my interview we talked about a few things which was documentation of work order history um, implementing preventive maintenance routines and then eventually getting to a point where we could have these repair versus replace conversations to drive optimal output and optimal use of equipment for the performance of the business. That was a challenge that I was willing to take on. Again, it didn't necessarily come easily. Um, it's much easier to tell someone something in an interview than it is to follow through on that long term. And again, my direct supervisor, the one who told me these things, left shortly before I decided to start looking. So that spurred the change in me because I was like, well, whoever comes in next may not have the same mentality. And do I want to be stuck here with someone else who doesn't have that same? Now, I could have stayed and I could have waited a little bit longer. But again, I had other personal factors in my life pulling me in a different direction personally. Um kind of allowed whoever the next plant manager came in to have a fresh start and again, bring in their ideas and then be able to bring in the right people to execute on those ideas. No, I, was, I was just think there's a couple of examples I I could give both from a personal point of view. It's a bit like um, buying a house and the garden's already, you know, got all lots of expensive plants. It's been laid out and there's a greenhouse there and there's a shed there. So it's already all set up and ready to go. For some people, that's great because they don't want to, you know, build a garden, you know, create a garden from scratch. But for others, they're like, oh, well, you know, I sort of wanted a blank canvas so I can create my own um, design. And it's yeah. not to say if you join an organization that's set up got the tools and everything. We've talked about ripping out tools or whatever, but that doesn't mean you can't stamp, you know, stamp some influence on on an organization. As long as you know, I guess maybe that's an interesting um area to to cover. I mean, how if someone comes in and they want to, you know, exert some influence, how important is it to have that that knowledge captured through technology or or otherwise, you know, on in a computer somewhere you know just yeah somewhere to be accessed how you know how, how important is that to that transition my transition it was key because it hit on all three elements they wanted which was repair versus replace which comes down to can you track cost against assets preventive maintenance i can do that in excel spreadsheet right it's not easy but i can do it and the, the more i start implementing the harder it's going to become to manage so it becomes more of an admin function to manage it versus it aiding me in my job and then work order history. Again, that can be done on sticky notes, depending on how much detail you want to track. Um, but I wanted a real easy way of searching through that and querying that information kind of on the fly. And again, I'm accustomed to nowadays my smartphone, right? So, hey, do you have an app I can just put on there and it's easy to use and I'll enjoy using it and it simplifies my workflow? Cool. I think to your point about buying a new house and having a blank canvas versus a garden, it's where it comes back to the individuals and this is the onus on them to understand what they're getting themselves into and what they really wanted. 
why buy something that isn't a blank canvas if what you really want is a blank canvas? So you have to decide and you have to prioritize. And that's where uh, businesses may be at a disadvantage nowadays because it's an employee's market, right? It's a candidate's market. They can choose where they go and they now have access to, they have access to your employees to ask the actual day-to-day -day information, right? How does it actually function from day-to-day? they're looking for social proof of what you do online and then they have access to see what kind of technologies you implement and what you use or they can expect in their day-to-day -day. for me i i just took the challenge at face value um we made some improvements but if i really wanted to and again looking back now now i've learned some of those things i'm going to go to an organization not establishing a pm culture from the ground up I'm probably not going to do that again, not unless there's a lot of things in place, like a formal policy that this is the direction we're going. And I can hold the business accountable no matter how much leadership change happens. Yeah. And I guess flipping it to the the, the business side, I guess that they have to set their own expectations too, in terms of if they're looking and recruiting then they, you know, if they if they have a relatively blank canvas and are open to change, then they need to focus on candidates with that mindset, and or vice versa. If there's an established thing in place, maybe someone, you know, who's happy just to come in and sort of tweak around the edges and make you know optimizations to some of those strategies, I guess as well. I mean, look at business or job postings online, right? And look at some of the the qualification requirements. So you, you have this, let's say, an organization that they know they want this change and they want to change in a certain direction. But rather than prioritizing the experience implementing or in organizations with that change, they just kind of do the same old generic generic and they post who must have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and must have 15 years of experience, but yet must be under the age of 30. Like, right, all these all these things just to keep throwing in these job posting. That's not an accurate statement, but the idea is there of you need to speak in that job posting of what you're trying to do in the direction. And that may come back to the, the business culture that you represent through the mission, vision, and value statements. I think we've talked about this the last time we started going down the rabbit hole of culture is those mission, vision, and value statements. They need to be simple and they need to be pertinent to everyone in your organization. Right. Like the operators at the equipment must be able to tell you what the organization's mission, vision and value statements are. And it must be something that they actually carry out and do. It, it just doesn't need to be this empty words on a statement on a website. Right. Again, it's just it's just for lure or show or it's been crafty or fancy wordsmithing. It needs to actually mean something. And then we, we as an organization must revolve around those values or those habits that we have because those interactions and what those values are, like if it's trust or if it's uh, collaboration, we must exemplify that every day because if you say collaboration, but yeah, I do a, f a factory tour and then your operators and I'm asking how they interface with maintenance and they say, that's not my job. That's not much collaboration there. Right. And that's going to tell me there's a disconnect between leadership and the facility. No, that makes, that makes, yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think we're maybe coming to the end of our discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground, which it, it's been really sort of a fascinating topic. I guess, Corey, just to sort of tie, tie things up for, for people experiencing some of the, the issues we've, discussed today particularly around um yeah around that next generation and attracting the next generation into these roles what would be your sort of tips for them to or at least things for them to start thinking about and putting in place in their organizations to to to, to help that and there's maybe not a simple answer but just some starting points i guess it's a great question I'm trying to see if i can whittle it down so where to start with mitigating the the skills gap is what you're asking yeah yeah exactly and i know it's a very broad topic like so there's lots of areas you could cover but maybe just yeah just a few sort of starting points let's say or initial or just some thoughts that they should 
things I should consider um, at the top of the list? I think they need to take inventory. It's going to come back to you need to revisit your mission, vision, and value statements, right? Are they actual characteristics that are exhibited on the day-to-day interaction between all of your staff employees every single day? Um, do they lead to the right culture and the right um, the right exchanges and the right habits that you want, that you prefer in your facility? You need to assess where you wanna be. So how do we do what we do today, but then also where do we wanna be? And then with that future state, understand what skills you're gonna need to meet that. And then you need to take inventory of what skills you have in, in your facility, in your grasp today. You need to do a skills gap in, uh, analysis. And then from a leadership standpoint, you need to start identifying short-term, long-term, internal, external, how you can remedy that skills gap. Again, whether it's upskilling, and reskilling your current staff. Um, again, trying to implement operator care where your maintenance can focus on higher end level technologies or implementation of a PDM and less on day to day. It needs to be a team effort, but then you need to approach that. So if I can recap that and try to make it simple, you need to understand where you are today, where you want to be, And then you need to map out a process for that. I don't mean to tie this back to it, but I presented a few times this year at a few different trade shows. And I talked about the use of the OODA loop. The OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, and act. It was a a military um, time critical decision-making framework. It can be used for leadership. It can also be employed to your front line. But it just means kind of sit back right now and observe the interactions that are happening figure out where your biggest area of opportunity is. And if the skills gap is it, then you need to orient yourself to some solutions or some partners that can help remedy those. You need to decide how to act or decide how you're going to act. And then you need to act. And that act may be creating a formal document internally governing how we capture tribal knowledge today, how we're going to move forward and capture information and standardize our process moving forward. And then what kind of partners or solutions are going to help us achieve that, right? Like a CMMS, I can tell you right now, can do that for you. Um, Sensei is going to alleviate some of that tribal knowledge as well by utilizing, like, I think it's called the attention engine, right? Of learning what your team likes to see, what recommendations and prompts they like. And it's going to learn from that over time. It's going to augment your staff. There's another tool that uh, Siemens has invested in. It's called DeepHow. And it's the ability to take videos of technicians performing certain procedures like your older generation, your workforce, let the newer generation sit there and take a video of them performing tasks. And then the AI built into it will build out a procedure list for you that you can import into your CMMS or to your learning management system. All right. So there there are tools out there that can help kind of bridge this knowledge gap in different forms and fashions. That's amazing. I didn't even, didn't know about the last one. I'm gonna have to write it down and and Google it myself. I guess the the final point to that is um, maybe a final point to round up on. But how important are vendors, uh, technology vendors in in this process? How important can they? How can they contribute to this and help their customers reach you know reach that goal? They're huge. They're huge when you find the right ones, right ones that again mirror the same mission, vision, and values that your organization holds dear. So finding synergies with vendors that not only say they're going to do something, but actually do it and set clear expectations up front. Again, far too often, especially in the marketing world, um, the maintenance industry falls victim to buzzwords and they they get overhyped or oversold on certain things and it fails to deliver what they were told or what they interpreted was the outcome of these certain solutions. So find vendors that are going to be upfront with you and draw clear lines in the sand of telling you what's realistic and what's not. Help kind of clear the fog of those buzzwords and then stand by and support the products that they offer. Again, as more people move to SaaS, that's the value statement of SaaS. You no longer have to pay for additional services and support. It's included a lot of SaaS products. It's included with the subscription Therefore, if they don't deliver what they told you it was going to, after we've set clear understanding of the products, 
you can leave, right? And that's the beauty of it. It's kind of like my Netflix. If I've watched all the videos I wanted to and there's nothing else, I can cancel it for a month. And when they release something cool, I can come back, right? Or I can find a better fit for me. And now you have all uh, as service options, uh, subscriptions, but find the right vendor for you. Find someone who is actually going to deliver on the promises and support the product, but also who aren't overselling or overhyping what they offer. Exactly. They, they walk the walk as well as talk the talk, as they say. They um, yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, to summarize that to a degree, I guess it's, it maybe it's a bit, bit sort of cheesy to say, but it's always like the, the customer and the, the vendor are like one team. And again, that's how I'd describe the team within Siemens or Sensei, predictive maintenance, particularly, um, which I've involved in. It beca- it's that sort of relationship where it's, there's very little line between you know, visible line between the two, except they do work for separate organizations, but in all but name, they're essentially one team trying to deliver success for that product and, you know, and support their processes, et cetera. Um, I think that's why it was a great fit for Siemens to acquire Brightly because same thing, we took that customer first approach from day mm-hmm. one in 1999 when we started, right? We we delivered what we said we were going to deliver for our clients. And they come back to our user conference every single year and say the same thing. Like you do what you said you were going to do. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have 14,000 plus clients in different industries, right? They, They would not come back and they wouldn't stay here and the company wouldn't be where we are. And now Siemens is just going to take it to another level. No, exactly. I could say a similar, um, different, different size of companies, but a similar, a similar, um, Thinking with with um with set the Sensei acquisition as well. Um, I think the sentiments um definitely the same. But um, but yeah, I think that that concludes us nicely today. So um, thank you, Corey, again for another great conversation. Great to have you on um on the podcast again. Um, I might what did I call it? Friends of trend detection or something that sounds a bit uh, i'll come up with something better i think than that um <laughs> to for, all, for all the repeat visitors <laughs> it, yeah something like something like that but um but no it's, it has been great and it's really i think it's a really fascinating um subject and one that's not going to go away overnight but um like I said, yeah like i said there's there's a lot of positives as well um i think that's clear from our conversation but um yeah. i guess Finally, I mean, what we'll do in the show notes, I mean, we mentioned the white paper that Brightly have put together. So we'll link to that in the show notes as well as um, Corey's very active on LinkedIn as well, as as he mentioned a couple of times. So I definitely recommend um, following him on there as well. I mean, we could actually also link to your previous episode as well for those sort of interested in that because that was another great um, chat we had. Um, but, um, But yeah, besides that, I think um thank you yeah thank you Corey, and thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you on the next episode thank you very much thanks now and we're out <laughs> cool. cut cool uh, uh, is that okay for you do you think yeah I, I think i got a little long-winded there a few times I was trying to like balance what I had like put thought to and written down in the document, but also try to just wing it and flow with it. Um, yeah, no, I think I've, it was good. I think it was good. I think we, we delved into a lot of sort of different areas and things, which is exactly how I like these conversations to organically, um, yeah, progress in that way. So I thought that was quite nice. My brain fart in the middle. I don't have many, but sometimes – your mind no, just goes okay. completely blank, but that's what editing's for, right? So <laughs> hey, that's what happens when you have back to back to back to back to backs. No, I get it. Just hopefully yeah. in some of those a little bit longer winded uh, comments, there was hopefully some value that we can derive out there. Again, hopefully I'll whittle it down to a few action items. I don't think the action items I did at the end were as good, but again, I, I had scrolled down. I was looking at the technology and then the candidates from the paper, like the last three questions. And you asked that and I was like, oh crap, I got to go back up to the uh, like reactive to proactive approach. <laughs> so I, I try to like almost tiptoe back to that, but I wanted it to be a little different, but then I was just winging it and I was like, okay, maybe this was too much. No, no, not at all. But yeah, sorry for flip flopping around. It's um, no. okay. 
I tend to jump around um, a bit with the conversation um, rather than it just reading like, well, literally me reading off questions and you answering them. I think it, it yeah. comes, it was conversational. That's what we can say. So that's exactly yeah. the vibe we wanted. But um, oh. I but guess yeah, so, in the yeah, class yeah. four, I probably should have just reiterated the four steps from the white paper. I feel like that probably would have been uh, a good point for there, but yeah. That's okay. No, we'll, yeah, we'll certainly share the link to it and everything so people can delve into it a bit more. Um, but yeah, it's basically the same drill as before. So it'll probably be due to the length, like three part parter again, three part series, the video on YouTube, and and at some point, a later point, potentially some more clips for you to use on um, LinkedIn if you wish. So yeah, I do um, like the clips. Yeah. No. Cool. So yeah, as soon as they're they're available, well, as soon as as I'm publishing them, I'll share them, and as soon as we've got clips as well, I'll share the whole batch with you, so you can share however you want on your side. Okay. So good. Yeah. Me. Cool. Um, but yeah, no. Thank you again. It's been great to um, great to connect again. Um, thank you for being on the podcast again. Really appreciate cool. you taking the time out. Thanks, Thanks for asking me to be back on. Again, it was, it was good to have a little bit more focus this time. Again, last time, the whole first 30-minute part was just my background, and I was like, ooh, that was that was a little long. That's why when you asked me to introduce myself this time, I was like, all right, Corey, keep it a lot shorter <laughs> this time. If they really want to know the full-length story, they can go back to the older episode. Yeah, that's true. No, no, but, no, but it's, no it's interesting. Cause, well, I don't know many people have taken that part of, so in a way – if it was a whole episode, if it, yeah, if that was the case, and I think that's worthy of an episode, to be honest. Uh, the journey um, across from that's quite an interesting one, yeah. and yeah. it was an interesting one. But um, but yeah, no, thank you again, and um, yeah, I'll invite you on again very soon. Um, I'm sure if we find another topic, if, yeah, if you think of any topics and you think, just let me know. If you, I'm more than open for you to come back on again. Um, if yeah. if, that's if you case. see anything on LinkedIn that again catches your eye, let me know. Mm. Um, sometimes I I take a broad stroke to some of the posts, so I really haven't like delved in or done much research. So just knowing which topics you like allows me to do a little bit more back end research. So again, be, okay. speak from a little bit more of a a standpoint, a, a depth knowledge standpoint versus a broad knowledge. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. I will. I'll keep an eye out and let you know if I um if I spot anything. Um yeah, that that would work. But um cool. Awesome. And hey, from my team, thank you. Uh, I know there was a smart factory document sent out that focused a lot, a lot around Sensei recently from Siemens and it included some parts from Brightly on there. So it was it was really cool to see us in the Siemens name, especially on Siemens documents and Siemens websites starting to populate more. And I know we started kind of boothing up at a few trade shows in different industries as well. Because like my managers at uh, the American Manufacturing Excellence Summit in Cleveland right now, and he's in the okay. Sense I, or not since I in Siemens's booth. So like we partnered up, but I recommended to my team, especially Greg Collins, as our channel. Uh, VP here, he came from Siemens. I think he came from SI specifically, okay. but he's been pushing for synergies. Um, I pushed a few people towards, I think, Andy Gailey that you have a relationship with there in the UK, the yeah. consultant for uptime. So we're pushing there for potential expansion into UKI for the CMMS asset essentials. Okay. Um, and then I pushed on them of partnering up and bringing Siemens with us to SMRP next year or in future years. Again, because of the relationship with IAM and uh, PMAC, I think it could be a cool opportunity. Oh, cool. I think I know, I know you said you knew about SMRP as well or previously did yeah. some stuff with them. So, yeah, pre, yeah, pre yeah, with Sensei, we, we've done some stuff there. Um, yeah. And I, I believe there's some discussions going on between. Well, there has been brightly, and um, maybe even opportunities. We're discussing um, joint opportunities and things like that because I think you've got access to markets, you know, that we we've not really tapped into. So I think it's mainly exploring whether sense I could work in other in other verticals as well, which would be an interesting discussion. 
I know from a sales and technology standpoint, there are those conversations happening like really active right now, especially for manufacturing. Yeah. Um, the only issue is the market generally you're in is true enterprise where mm. we, we do some enterprise, but mostly is mid market for us. Yeah. So it's either how do you get synergies into our mid market clients that are mature enough, or how do we kind of tag team into some of the, the, the SMEs of the enterprise world that makes sense. Yeah, no, exactly. Cause we're almost full blown enterprise. Yep. Um, that's good. Well, I was yeah. at SMRP with one of our senior VPs of, uh, strategy, Dwayne, and he, he came from an MP2 background. So a very well-known CMMS back in the day kind of rivaled the Maximo. And he was saying that digital industries themselves, they do have a standing relationship with Maximo in enterprise like true enterprise. So yeah, they do. Yeah. Again, when is that agreement up? How, how strict is that? And again, we're not a true enterprise tool. Siemens has to make the decision on whether to grow us into that or not. So that's the Siemens, that's a Siemens discussion point that is probably being talked about in a dark room in Germany right now, but. Yeah, we'll see. Sounds interesting. We'll see. We'll see. I'm here for the ride. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thank you again, Corey. Um, and yeah, I'll be in touch soon once we start, start on the publishing schedule. But yeah, thank you again. It was really cool. good. Nope. Thank you, Now, Cool. Speak to you again soon. Thank you. Yep. Cheers. Bye. Please like and subscribe on all major podcast channels and find out more about Sensei Predictive Maintenance at Siemens.com.